Hello everyone. I'm Soni Jain, Chairperson Young Fikki Ladies Organization Kolkata. I welcome you all to another session of Kitab, an initiative of Prabha Khetan Foundation presented by Shri Cement Limited. Today's session is in association with Penguin Random House, Vaiklo Kolkata and Spectrum Pune. Established by Dr. Prabha Khetan, Prabha Khetan Foundation provides platforms to caregivers, committed individuals, and like-minded institutions to implement cultural, educational, literary, and social welfare projects in 38 cities in India and overseas. The pandemic has not been able to deter the foundation's noble cause. Prabha Khetan Foundation has shifted gears using the virtual world to continue with the various sessions to keep up the spirits of its patrons. The birth of a book always calls for a celebration. Kitab provides a platform to authors to display and showcase their newest literary works before a discerning audience and media through tastefully curated book launches. Today, we have with us the veteran journalist, Mr. Veer Sangvi. Mr. Veer Sangvi was the editor of Hindustan Times from 1999 to 2004 before being promoted to editorial director a post he held till 2007, after which he continued at the publication as a columnist. His television career includes several award-winning shows on the Star TV network, NDTV, Discovery, and other channels. He has a parallel career as India's leading food and travel writer. Today, at Kitab, Veer's new book, A Rude Life, The Memoir, will be launched by none other than the veteran Indian journalist, Mr. Prem Prakash, Mr. Prem Prakash is currently the chairman of ANI, India's premier multimedia news agency, which he had also helped to set up. Mr. Prakash has interacted with every prime minister of India as, and interviewed many of them on camera, and also has worked with various pioneering foreign broadcasters in France, Germany, and the USA. I would request Mr. Prem Prakash to formally launch the book and hold it for a photo op on your right side, please. I request Mr. Sangvi also to join in. Mr. Prakash and Mr. Sangvi, I just request you to uh, hold the book on your right side for a photo. Right. Right. Thank you so much. I would request the audience to now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's very inter interesting conversation between these two stalwarts of Indian journalism. Thank you. Well, uh, before that, Mrs. Jain and uh, Virji, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here today. I accepted the idea of releasing this book immediately because I have a very high regard for Veer, particularly when he brought about uh, those big changes into what was Delhi's own newspaper, Hindustan Times. And uh, Veer, it was a pleasure to read all about it in your chapter about Hindustan Times, how you managed to do it. Well done, my man. Well done. Thank you, sir. And, so, oh, uh, sir, before you go any further, can I just say something? Yes. It's one of the honors of my life to be talking to you. You are a legend, an institution in this profession. You are pretty much the father of video journalism in India. You've launched Indian video journalism all over the world at a time when most of us were still struggling with print. So it's a really great honor for me that you're launching the book. Thank you. You, sir. Are, you are very kind. You are very kind. But having said all that uh, about you, Veer, Gee, what I am surprised is, now having read uh, the whole book, you are very much a self-made person. Yes. Right from the age 15, when yes. you had to take your own decisions about how you get into school. My God, I admire you. And Thank for all that work, you named your book a rude life? No, your <laughs> life has not been rude. Your yeah. life has not been rude. Your life has been full of adventure, full of uh, action. Uh, well, it's a pleasure for me to say that. And uh, uh, nice to have launched this book now. And I hope it uh, really sells all over the country very well because there's so much to learn from it. There's so much to learn from it. 
of in all your struggle and how you managed it. Now, uh, it's been amazing for me to read that how you've been taking your own decisions. Yes. Right from the age 15. And uh, you must be the very one person who managed to get his own admission into the school in UK and there or thereafter into Oxford. Yes, so can sir. you tell us something about that period of yours? Yes, sir. I mean, I, I am a self-made man to a limited extent. I'm not like you who created something in a huge institution out of nothing. But in my own small way, I did things myself. It happened because I was born to a certain upper middle class background. My life was going fine till my father died suddenly at the age of 50 when he was 15. I was an only child and I think my mother fell to pieces. So it was left to me to try and figure out what I would do next. I was already at a boarding school in India, which was paid for, thank God. And I'm very grateful for that advantage. My father's relatives were looking after enough money for me to be educated, but nobody knew how I would be educated. My father had always intended that I go to school in England, which sounded fine in theory, but in principle, nobody knew where to send me. So I went off to England. I stayed with relatives. I found the public school's handbook. I was looking for a school that suited me, that was in London, that gave me a degree of freedom. I called various schools. Some were kind, some were a little indifferent. The one school I was keen on was a school called Mill Hill in London. And they were very sniffy. And they said, you know, people are registered here months in advance, years in advance. What do you mean by just calling and saying, can I join in two months time? So after they put me off, I said, what the hell? I have nothing to lose. So I called the headmaster and in those days, there were no mobiles, nothing. They put me through the switchboard and he said, come and see me. So I was very, very fortunate. I went and saw him. He was a very nice man. And he asked me about my circumstances. So I told him and he had me interviewed by various teachers, the head of the history department, the head of the English department. And he said, OK, they seem keen on you. Will you be able to join in September? So I said, yes. He said, who will pay your fees? So I said, I will. He said, how? So I pulled out a checkbook. And I paid the first term's fees by signing the check, which I think impressed him even more. Mm -hmm. And I joined. And I was just, I mean, it's nice for you sir, to say I'm self-made, but I had enormous advantages, at least to be in that position. And I was, I've been very lucky all my life to depend on the kindness of strangers. This principal was a prince headmaster of a big boarding school in England. He had no reason to take my call. There was really no space in the school. He had no reason to create a space for me. And I had two very successful years there before I went to Oxford. And it was what I was somebody who had nothing really going for me, except the decency and kindness of other people. Well, that's uh, I read that and uh, I was really uh, touched and uh, inspired by it that how a young boy of 15 could do all that. Well done, we well done. Now, I have another uh, in around you mentioned in your book that around 1964, the police charged Dilip Kumar as being a Pakistani spy. Yes. Well, Indian police does that to all kinds of people all the time. What was it about? Uh, can you tell us more, anything, anything more about that incident? Well, my father knew Dilip Kumar. My father knew him in the sense that Dilip Kumar made a film called Ganga Jamna, which some of you may remember. And mm -hmm. the censors wanted innumerable cuts. My father was his lawyer. They fought this battle. They got the film through. Then, I mean, I was very small, but I admired Dilip Kumar. I liked him. One day he came to see my father and his face was pale. And he said, I think they're going to arrest me. So my father said, don't be ridiculous. You're the idol of this country who will arrest you. On what charge? And he said of being a Pakistani spy. So, I mean, all of us looked at him, uh, jaws dropping. Even I, who was very small, thought the idea was preposterous. Because, I mean, we now laugh at all this stuff about nation building and we are cynical about it. But you will know, Premji, because you were there. Everybody in that generation had a real sense 
of we have to create this nation, we have yeah. to be united, we have to be one. And Dilip Kumar was pretty much at the forefront of those efforts. He worked with Panditji. He made films on national integration for free. He went and raised money every time there was a flood. So to say that was absurd. <clears throat> but what had happened was this. The Calcutta police had caught a boy who they said was a Pakistani spy. They had recovered a diary from him in which there were names of various people, including oh. apparently Dilip Kumar. On the basis of this very flimsy evidence, they took, they took a train in those days, arrived in Bombay, told the Bombay police, in those days, I suppose it's less easy now, police from one city could go to another city, told the Bombay police that they were here on an espionage busting mission, went to Dilip Kumar's house, raided it, looked for evidence, you will not believe me, of a radio transmitter with which he used oh. to allegedly communicate with Pakistan. Of course, they found nothing. But he was just so traumatized. I remember my father and he then went to Delhi. He spoke to Panditji. And finally, the matter was dropped. But for a few days, it really seemed possible that he would be arrested. And it was an eye-opener to me that if the police really want to get you, they don't really need much evidence. They can come and do what they want to, even to somebody as committed to national integration and patriotism as Dilip Kumar. Of course, you will be cleared eventually, but what happens in the interim, you suffer. Well, having seen the, in my childhood, the end of the British uh, era, I'm not surprised about the police. Yeah, This, this police was... Uh, trained with that and they continue to be living in the, that legacy. That's how they used to do it at that time too. I remember my father once telling me that uh, they were carrying some 32 uh, independence uh, struggle uh, uh, prisoners. Suddenly two of them managed to run away. Mm. They just, uh, just picked up two more from the street. Really? Yes, they just picked up two more from the street because they had to give the number 32. No, it is, it is terrifying. No, how much we accepted what the British used to do, what we fought against, became mm. sort of normal for our police. This story, I was always too young for this, but my father told me this, that they went with the Dilip Kumar thing to meet Panditji. And the Kumar was obviously very distressed. And Panditji said to him, I know what it's like when the police comes to your house to arrest you. It can be very traumatic. And Dilip Kumar, who's not an arrogant man, said to him, he said, uh, Panditji, with great respect, when the police came to your house to arrest you in the freedom struggle, you were a hero. When the police come to arrest me, I will be a traitor. Mm -hmm. so, that was yeah. an important distinction. Absolutely. Now, I also noticed that uh, your interest in journalism, Virji, really began at Mayo. When yes, you created this school magazine. Was that which finally led you towards journalism? Sir, I don't know. I mean, I think journalism is a series of accidents, but editing the school magazine, writing, I mean, there were not that many things I was good at. Writing was one of them. So it was the natural thing to do. I became, I think, one of the youngest editors of the school magazine. I wrote a lot. I edited it. I then went off to Mill Hill School, where again, I got awards for writing for the school magazine. So for better or for worse, writing came relatively easy to me. So I had, in those days, you used to take the Oxford entrance exam in December and you went up to university in October. So December to October was known as your so-called gap year. So I spent part of that gap year in Mayo College teaching for a term. And the rest of it, I was at a bit of a loose end. And some friends of mine, a friend of mine, his mother worked for the people who started India Today. And they were desperate for somebody, India Today was not very well known. We were into the emergency. They were desperate for somebody who was hanging around, would do it for nothing. And mm -hmm. I was available and I was happy to do it. I remember we used to get in those days for a full length article of what, 1400 words, about 150 rupees. That's right. That's right. And of a small item on the people page, about 25 rupees. Sometimes mm -hmm. if we were lucky, 50 rupees. So no sensible person could have made a living on that. But mm -hmm. I was kid. I hadn't yet gone up to college. It came easily. It was fun. And as you said, written at school. So that's how I drifted into it gradually. Finally, I find you started your career in journalism at India Today. Yes, sir. Now I'm going to ask you a question which you may not like to answer. I will answer. If you don't, do, just feel free. All right. You see, India Today was launched in December 75. Yes. Emergency came in June. 
Yes. And uh, from what I remember, it was Muhammad Yunus who was very close to Mrs. Gandhi. Yes. And uh, also to Sanjay Gandhi. Yes. Who impressed upon uh, Vilas Puri, the father of uh, uh, Arun, owner of Thompson Press, to start this publication to project new disciplined India of emergency. And that's the impression we had. Because remember, I had to spend three months myself away from India into exile. Yeah. What's your impression? I was a very junior person, but I will tell you what I remember. And I was a freelancer. What I remember of the early years of India today, Mr. V.V. Puri, who, as you mentioned, was a wealthy man. He owned Thomas Thompson Press, Thompson Press. financier. Somebody approached him and asked him to start something for Indians who were living abroad. He started what was apparently a newsletter. His daughter, Madhutrayan, then lived in New York. She came back and she said, no, no, it should be a news magazine. She started India Today then. Madhu, I think, if I'm, I may be wrong on this because I was very much an outsider, went away to America again. The magazine was then edited by a lady called Uma Vasudev, who yes. was a distinguished yes. journalist, but was also a friend of Mohammed Yunus. And certainly during this period, the impression did go out that the emergency was an era of discipline and era of India today. And Uma Masudev and Mohammed Yunus were doing this. I'm not sure the Puris were necessarily part of this because when they parted away with Uma Vasudev, they appear to have had some kind of altercation with Mohammed Yunus, which I think Arun Puri wrote about a year or so later. So yes, there was that phase when the emergency was certainly portrayed in glowing terms in India today. But it was a little more complicated than V.V. Puri starting it at the behest of the government. There were many phases. Yes, I'm aware of the uh, fact that uh, Arun had a uh, uh, serious altercation with uh, Muhammad Yunus. I'm aware of that. And uh, uh, now when Janata government came to power after emergency, feeling that many of us had at that time that it didn't live up to its word of inner party democracy because it didn't allow election of the parliamentary leader. Yes. And uh, Muraji Desai was virtually imposed on the party as a consensus candidate by Jay Prakash Narayan and uh, Acharya Kriplani. Uh, what do you think of it? I thought it was appalling because they had won this election saying they opposed the undemocratic tendencies of Indira Gandhi. And yet, once the newly elected parliamentary party was formed and they'd met, there should have been an election for the new leader. Instead, uh, Kriplani and JP met MPs individually and decided that they were going to make uh, Muraji their side prime minister. I thought it was a mistake for many, many reasons. First of all, there should have been an election. Secondly, when you have a coalition, we never had a coalition in the center in India. Oh, you right. need somebody who can do a bit of give and take, who can understand how to manage a coalition. Okay. Raj, and, you will, and you will know him much more than I do, was an extremely rigid, extremely stubborn, extremely self-righteous man who had no ability to reach out to people, no ability to strike any kind of compromise. And at least in my eyes, no moral legitimacy because he'd been imposed on the party by JP and Acharya Kriplani. So the moment he became prime minister, I thought they were in trouble. Yep. And you also uh, see Muraji never was never tired of claiming himself to be a very upright person and all that. Yeah. Yet I find in your book, that he stole papers from the uh, Prime Minister's office. Yes, sir. he stole every secret paper he could get his hands on. And he came to Bombay. He lived in a building called Oceana on Marine Drive, overlooking the ocean. And yes. he lived in this strange room. I went to meet him quite often. He would sit cross-legged on the floor. And the room had many cupboards. And on top of those cupboards, you remember in the old days, Air India, if you traveled first class, you yes. to free attache cases. You got a bag, you got a bag. <laughs> so, we all get so he had like many, many attache cases. And I don't know what was in them. But it turned out that he had stolen every secret file he could lay his hands on. And he gave it to oh my a God. colleague of mine called Arun Gandhi, 
to do a book based on his time as prime minister. And I used to be in a newspaper office, which was an open office. Uh, and Arun Gandhi used to come in with these papers. And we would look at them. The pews would look at them. The clerks would look at them. And they all said, eyes only, top secret, confidential, government of India documents. And Muraji, with absolutely no shame, had just stolen them and was asking Arun, to write a book which said that Muraji was a staunch, upright Gandhian who had gone to Delhi to save India, but the evil Indira Gandhi, the evil Jigjeevan Ram, and the evil Charan Singh had foiled this brave Gandhian's attempt to save India. And to illustrate the story, he had these documents. In fact, the documents didn't actually illustrate a story at all. Among the documents, for instance, was a document by a letter written by President Sanjeeva Reddy to him complaining about Kanti, who was Muraji's son, who was supposedly involved in many deals, and the fact that Kanti wanted shady people invited to Rashtrapati Bhavan. So it was not as though Muraji understood what he was doing. He just open-handedly grabbed whatever he could, took it and ran off to Marine Drive. I don't think any prime minister in the history of India or any democratic country no, has no. done anything like it. I would call him a thief. I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, and a thief of war. Your and my secrets, our country's secrets. Mm. In your uh, chapter 14, yes, sir. you say you enjoyed hanging around the newspaper offices in the West. Yes. You were an editor by that time. You were the youngest editor in India. What were you enjoying in that? Sir, I was, we are now talking about 1981. Mm -hmm. I was 25 years old. I yes. was really yes. old. <laughs> I'd been a small time editor in India of a small magazine called Bombay to be yes. at the Sunday Times. I mean, first of all, it freaked me out that there were these two big buildings next to each other. One was the Times, one was the Sunday Times. The Sunday Times came out once a week and it had a building that was the size of the Times, which was the daily. And these were bylines, these were people I'd read for a long time, people I looked up to. So just to hang around to see how they work, it was a fairly heady, heady feeling for a young journalist. Well, in your chapter about Mehun Dawn, Ji. you describe so many of Bombay's uh, dons, including uh, uh, Daud Ibrahim, Yusuf, Kareem Lala, or all these people. Tell us something about them. Well, they were very odd. I mean, the underworld in Bombay went through many phases. There was a phase when the primary activity these guys engaged in was gold smuggling, which is what you see in films like Diwar and Co, which is, Diwar is basically based on the life of Haji Bastan, who was, as the film says, a coolie, a guy from a very, very poor background, who by becoming a smuggler, made some money and became a gang leader. So to go and meet these guys in a way was interesting because they believed in the legend of their of themselves and they talked about it but that underworld was changing first of all and this is i think a very sad commentary on india haji mastan and yusuf patel who were like the two big well dons for want of a better term who i know who'd had a fight haji mastan had had yusuf shot yusuf had been left dying on the streets had recovered haji mastan had said if allah wants him alive then he will become my partner so it was all very hindi film stuff <laughs> but, yeah but all these guys ultimately gave up smuggling and they went into construction in bombay in those days in Bombay, they had something called the Bombay Rent Act, which meant that if you gave your flat on rent or gave a flat on rent, effectively it was impossible to evict the tenant. So, like what, do. Yeah, so what these guys would do is they would buy a building at a knockdown rate from some landlord who couldn't evict the tenants. And then they would use strong arm muscle. They would burn the building. They would evict all the tenants. And after that, they would redevelop them, build new flats and sell them at huge profit. And both Yusuf and Masan said to me, it's a big mistake going into crime. There's more money in construction. So all of them ultimately became racketeers, builders, built the new parts of central Bombay and made much more money. But even while they were doing this, the younger gundas, all of them who Masan thought would look up to him, etc., doing shootouts on the street, killing each other at petrol pumps. And Masan told me a story of calling Dabu and his 
rivals and saying, settle down, you're doing us a disservice. And he made them put their hands on the Quran and swear an oath saying that we will do no more of this. They said, yes, yes, Mastan Bhai. They went home the next morning. They were out on the streets shooting <laughs> each other. Eventually, Dawood escaped to Dubai. And the rest, you know, is history. But the two interesting things for me were that that old Dibar style gangster couldn't last in Bombay. The mm-hmm. Dawood style gangster would last. And B, that such was the mess we made of our development that there was more money being a builder than there wasn't being a smuggler. Like, uh, I saw a cartoon somewhere mm-hmm. where a, a bank robber is uh, holding a gun on the uh, b- banker. And the banker says, wait a minute, you don't have to do this. Just ask us for a loan. <laughs> Spot on. Absolutely right. Nothing has changed. It's exactly the same thing. You can take the loan and run away. There's no problem. <laughs> You've got to be stupid to be a violent criminal in India. There's much more money in white collar crime. Yes. You have written about VP Singh. Yes, sir. And my own feeling at that time about VP Singh when he was the finance minister was that he was out to get Rajiv Gandhi. That he had his own ambitions. I don't know whether I was right, but uh, uh, because I saw very strange things about him later on. He would come to Europe when he was ill with all his security men and stay in all these big hotels and uh, spend huge amounts of government money. The guy was a small time bar- Raja or God knows what. And uh, what he did. It was the Raja of Manda. Manda, yes. What did you uh, make of him? It's odd. I, I knew him when he was finance minister and I was a Bombay journalist. And I would come to Delhi and I would meet him. And in those days, it was much easier for journalists, as you will know, to get access to politicians. Even so, for the finance minister of India, to Ooh. give so much access, pose for photographs to a journalist from publication that was not well known in Delhi was unusual. So I liked him. But it rapidly became clear to me, especially when I became editor of Sunday, that his ambition was not just to be Mr. Clean, which is what he said it was. His ambition was to go further, that he had a fairly vindictive streak, that he tried to destroy Amitabh Bachchan's political career. That's right. The battle with the Ambani's soon became not just about economics, but became about politics. That his officials, he always denied they were involved, were trying to use those battles and those charges to bring down Rajiv Gandhi. To what extent he was working in cohort or in collaboration with Arun Nehru, I don't know. But certainly there was more to him than met the eye. But Arun Nehru did join him uh, at that time. Yes, but Arun Nehru's version and VP Singh's version has always been that they were both thrown out by Rajiv Gandhi, so they had no choice. Rajiv Gandhi's version, as you will know, was that they were conspiring all the time. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned about Operation Blue Star. Yes, sir. How come you missed out on uh, the fact of uh, General Shabek Singh, who I knew uh, during the Bangladesh uh, liberation thing, and he was a highly decorated Indian officer. Yeah. And he was dismissed five days just before his retirement as a personal vendetta by the then Army Chief General Rena. Mm-hmm. And he had gone into the temple and uh, joined uh, Bindranwale. When he went in there, lots of his uh, retired JCOs and uh, soldiers also came in. And he organized the defense of. Uh, uh, go to temple. Now, the army should have known yes. what kind of a soldier he is, what kind of a did, uh, officer he is. And uh, uh, all these heavy casualties that army suffered at that time, because uh, as the first uh, posse of troops entered, tried to enter the temple, they were all killed. Yes, they were all killed. Uh, how come you missed uh, General Shabik? So it's a memoir. I don't. I didn't know him personally. I'd never met him, which is why I didn't write about him because I had nothing to add other than what I'd read in the newspapers. But you are absolutely right. He was, from all accounts, a brilliant general. And ultimately, the army, I think, ran that operation very badly. You cannot run this kind of operation as an infantry operation. And as you said, when the soldiers streamed into the temple, the 
Sikh militants were on both sides and they just gunned them down. We mm-hmm. suffered so many casualties. At the end of the day, the army what, destroyed the Akal Takht, did serious damage to Harmandir Sahib, took in APCs, I think possibly even a tank, did very great damage. And what were they fighting? They were fighting 500 men, mostly armed with hand, hand-held weapons. So it's a, tribute, it's a tribute to the general, Shubhek Singh, and the way in which he planned the defenses. But also, I think, and I get very unpopular for saying this, a great indictment of whoever planned Blue Star, and particularly whoever chose a day which was a martyrdom of a guru, and there were so many ordinary Sikhs who were trapped Absolutely. inside the temple. Yeah. You know, when they took the tank, so many uh, innocent pilgrims who were still inside, they were killed. Yeah. And, and let me, uh, if I may tell you something about myself. Gee. Let me tell you at that time, uh, a rumor went around uh, that Golden Temple was on fire. Yes, I remember that. And they blamed me. I, I didn't know that. Tell me that. Why did they blame they you? They blamed me in the sense that I have put out the, uh, the pictures. I said, don't be bloody silly. If you think uh, it's not on fire, then let me go there. Or you go there and bring the video. So they went there, Doordarshan sent, sent somebody there, they brought a video of about two and a half minutes. And they were so keen to run it, we they ran it without editing. Hmm. And do you know what it showed? No. Hundreds of dead bodies piled up in the corridors of the uh, Golden Temple. Next day, we published it. Of course, they gave us the uh, video immediately uh, as a promise, but I, I edited it and sent out. But, but that's sir, you will remember that these stories, I, I do remember now the video talking about the story of the Golden Temple being on fire, the visuals of all these dead bodies is what? I mean, it was unprecedented Indian history, but Sikh soldiers mutinied in many of the regiments after hearing these kind of rumors, seeing the, this kind of footage. Obviously, no thought was given to Sikh sentiment at all. No, absolutely not. See, uh, <laughs> you know, we were all there in Amritsar when Mrs. Gandhi went on air on the radio mm. and declared that uh, there was curfew in Amritsar and the army was moving. There was no ready curfew. There was no army. Nothing. We just uh, then drove all of us to uh, uh, the temple to find out what was going on. And met Sansan Sanji, and he said, "Look, uh, this afternoon they were t- uh, talking about talks, and now this is what they are doing." And then suddenly, I think it was basically the Punjabi mafia that had surrounded Mrs. Gandhi who did all this. Well, that's another story. I never actually found out who was in charge of that operation on mm-hmm. the political level. We know that General Surdarji was the army guy. That's right. According to Rajiv Gandhi, Arun Singh took a lot of interest. KP Singh, they were, most people seem to miss this, was MOS defense in those days. That's and right. he was quite actively involved in it. That's but true. otherwise, it was just, as you say, this Punjabi mafia around Mrs. Gandhi who took control. Absolutely. You have uh, known Amitabh Bachchan very well. Yes. And uh, could you please uh, tell us something about his foray into politics later on? And yes. Left- yeah. I, I knew him reasonably well because in 1980, I think it was, when he had banned the press, younger people not remember this, but there used to be magazines like Stardust, which wrote scurrilous gossip, and he retaliated by not giving any interviews. So yeah. Stardust banned him, and this cold war began between Amitabh Bachchan and the film press. So yeah. we put him on the cover of India today. And it was a big deal because he was the biggest star India had ever seen. And he wasn't giving any interviews at all. But he gave me access. I spent, I think, a week to 10 days with him. And I would go to the sets early in the morning, sit in his oh, van. Nice. And mm. sit in his van, waiting for the other stars to turn up. They'd turn up. He'd be there by 8. They'd turn up around 10, 30, 11. Shatrugan Sinha would come just as the shift was ending at around 2, 2, 30. And they would have to shoot most of his scenes with a double. And I would stay with him till the evening, till 7 or 8, when he went home. And sometimes I would go home with him. So I knew him reasonably well. And I knew that he hated the idea of joining politics. He was completely against it. And then yet, when I saw him properly in 84 again, he joined politics. And I said, why did you do it? And he gave me two reasons. One was, he said, in the emotional 
moments following Mrs. Gandhi's assassination, when Rajiv asked for his help, he could say he could not say no. The other was that some people will remember this in 1982. He suffered an accident on the sets of Puli. That's right. And he went to hospital, and for several weeks he hovered between life and death. And mm-hmm. all of India came to a standstill. People prayed for him. There was this frenzy. And I think that's he's a very private man. And I think he hadn't quite worked out how much people loved him. And that, I think, left a very deep impression on him. And he had the sense that perhaps he could give something back. Now, neither was a good reason for joining politics. And he is not at all cut out for politics. He had no idea of the sort of cesspool he was entering. And of course, it was an utter and complete disaster. That's right. And... uh... Now, at the time of the demolition of uh, Babri Masjid, Ji. the rumor mills in Delhi were strong in belief that there was a tacit understanding between Narsimha Rao and Advani. Yes. And uh, because when it happened, uh, we were, uh, I wanted some reaction and the Prime Minister wasn't available for several hours. All they told us was he was sleeping. That's very strange. And, so uh, I, I made the same calls. I got the same message. PM is resting. Yeah. What was your view at that time? That there, was there a tacit understanding between the two? I don't know. I don't know if people ever know what really happened. My own view is somewhat more charitable, of, not of Narsipara, but of Advani is slightly more charitable. I don't believe that Advani knew that the masjid was going to be demolished because... He looked quite shattered when it was happening. And Pramod Bhajan, who was there, told me that Advani burst to tears. You've known Advani longer than I have. You know mm-hmm. that cries are the slightest provocation. So they took Advani you away. Tell, tell all from someone who's seen. And they took him to a guest house. And he kept crying. And Pramod said, Advani, man, man ji, ho gaya ab. And he said, no, they have destroyed my movement. This is not how I had planned it. Where is the discipline, etc. So later he claimed it was the saddest day of his life, which it may have been, but only because his movement was destroyed, not because the Babri Masjid was destroyed. So I have always given him the benefit of the doubt and believed he did not know. What I think is probably correct is because all of us, you remember that period, thought it was highly likely that something untoward would happen and that the Karseva and all of that would turn nasty and that there would be some attack on the temple. Narasimha Rao did nothing. My view is that he decided not to get involved. That maybe it would be demolished, maybe it won't be demolished. It's possible he had an understanding with other people in the BJP. I'm not sure it was with Advani. But I can see why the rumor mills went into that kind of overdrive. Because Mm -hmm. he ignored everyone's advice, everyone's warnings that this would happen. And when it did happen, rather than being there in charge of the situation, the fellow was asleep. Yes, right. You see, uh, what I feel is, I wasn't there myself, but uh, my people were there. And uh, they had very narrow escape. They destroyed our camera. They destroyed the tape, everything. It was just one tape. Then we all agreed, uh, somebody had shot it, that we'll uh, use it as a pool. Because so many cameras were destroyed. That this was all planned. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. They were so quick. And they had these uh, iron things to uh, destroy the mosque. Well... That's history now. How would you describe uh, Vajpayee Rao, which we both uh, enjoyed? Yes, you will remember what he was like. He was a very amiable man. He was a nice man. He was not hysterical in any way. You could criticize him. He would listen to you. I was, he knew very well that I was ideologically opposed to everything the BJP stood for. He mm-hmm. never held that against me. He would not hold that against you. He was from a different era, which is when people can disagree with each other and still conduct civilized conversations. Those errors are over now in this age of social media and trolls and hatred on both sides. We no longer respect people who disagree with us. But the Vajpayee era in many ways was the golden age of that kind of politics. You're a very charismatic, very popular prime minister, but a prime minister who would listen to other people, who would Always take considered decisions. Your daughter of Smita and I traveled quite a lot with him when he traveled the world of the Prime Minister's plane, which is how we 
both became friends and at every time we were about to take off watchpai would come to the back of the aircraft he would ask us how we were mm-hmm. if this cabin was closed off we sometimes would be taken there but the first class section where bridesh mishra and all the high up sat the minister sat was open to the media we could go in absolutely could drink with bridesh you could find out what they were planning to do I mean, even with manmohan singh that didn't happen it was really a forgotten era mm-hmm. that, but uh, i enjoyed always traveling with vajpayee ji because a he would never uh, like to come out before 11 o'clock oh, that's right <laughs> and then in the afternoon to my own heart he didn't like early mornings yeah and then in the afternoon he like enjoyed his sleep yeah. <laughs> so you could well, do get up around 11 he would do a bit of work he'd have a very nice lunch he'd sleep a little bit he'd get up and then when we were traveling often he would go out to chinese restaurant or somewhere and he would take members of the press with him it okay. never happened before or after yeah and uh, oh, i enjoyed it that now uh, how did you find your move from print journalism to tv and that to to anchor the shows well you know everybody says it's a huge huge jump but frankly you remember that era mm. darshan which is where i moved to was not exactly nbc or cbs or the bbc the standard of anchoring was not very high so if you came from the print medium and you weren't very very shy was shy but not very very shy right. then you were at no disadvantage compared to anybody else so i imagine i haven't dared look at my tapes from those days <laughs> i was probably very very bad but the here's the thing i was no worse than other people who were on doordarshan and like many of us i made my mistakes on doordarshan so by the time the private sector was ready i was ready to to do it yes yes it did and then uh, you moved back to uh, edit hindustan times and as i said in my opening remarks i really enjoyed the way you changed the paper now uh, how do you explain, uh, can you explain to us the whole uh, whole lot of your experience at that time well as you probably know the hindustan times was the leading newspaper in delhi yes. but it was also the leading newspaper at the time when the middle class in delhi was overwhelmingly punjabi or punjabi influenced so the paper was run by those was owned by marwadis by the billas it was run by punjabis edited by punjabis written by punjabis which is why you had that thing about the only english language paper in the world to be written entirely in punjabi now that stopped with it stop working because a delhi became much more cosmopolitan it make up so punjabi dominated and even among the punjabis their children who were more modern more westernized wanted something else and the hd did not change with the times and kk birla who was very loyal to the managers he had installed wouldn't do anything about it even though his daughter shobhna bharti was then in charge when he finally saw the point and he gave shobhna a free hand and he hired me as editor we then worked very hard to modernize the paper to try and bring it in tune with the times i have been able to do it i am never hesitate to say only because shobhna wanted me to do it and she gave me a free hand and mm-hmm. mr birla who on occasion as you mentioned bg vergis kushwan singh there have been instances when his decisions on editors were influenced by political considerations in my case fortunately he didn't really bother about what my political views were he didn't agree with me on many things but he never put any kind of pressure on me so we were able to turn that paper around and we were able to actually when you look back at my career it's probably my single to the extent that i any achievement it's probably my single greatest achievement and the one that i'm proudest of well done now uh, being an amateur chef myself i enjoy cooking too oh, really what kind <laughs> what kind of food over yeah yeah and uh, now who how did you move into writing about food and you also did tv shows on food yeah galti said it happened i too enjoyed which i too enjoyed uh, yeah, i enjoyed it, reading about your uh, you. the brunch and all that i think i may i may be better known now as a food writer than as anything else but that was not the intention we were at the ht we were revamping the sunday magazine we done the dummy at said there had to be a food column food would be very big in the 21st century they couldn't find anyone to write it i wrote it for the dummy under a pseudonym then they said yeah you write it for the first 3 months we'll find someone they never found someone i ended up writing the damn thing and i mean the good side of it is that i was right food and travel did become very big 
in the 21st century. And because we turned the HT in that direction, there was an advantage in that the HT was then leading in that space, food and travel. And then Discovery Travel and Living came to me and said, would you like to turn the column into a TV show? And I said, yeah, but I don't want to do one. I will now make Paneer Makhani for you kind of show. I want to do one that is slightly more cerebral. For instance, when I was growing up, because I was from Bombay and I went to Ajmer, I was astonished that all the boys who'd come from Delhi did not know what a masala dosa was, did not know what an idli was. And yet now, by, we are now talking about 2002, 2003. Every canteen had idlis, every canteen had masala dosas. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do a piece on how that kind of South Indian food became famous all over India. And they said, yeah, we'll finance it. You travel, you do an episode on that. Then uh, there's a lot of mythology surrounding tandoori cooking. We are told that it's Afghan dishes, etc. It's not. This is Punjabi food created by Punjabi Hindus in Peshawar, who then came here as refugees, started Moti Mahal, these other restaurants, and made those dishes popular. Nobody had done anything on that. I said, I want to do some investigative television on that. They said, yes. So that's how, mainly because it seemed interesting and fun, I started doing food TV as well. And you also traveled uh, abroad to do food series. Yeah, I did a series for Discovery Travel Me called Veer Sangvi's Asian Diary. So that's right. I went to various Asian capitals and had fun. Hmm. Now, what all did you no, no, Tell me, you're a, you said you're a chef. What do you, what do you cook yourself? Well, I, I, I just uh, various button dishes. That's about that's about all. Not yeah. too much. Not too much. Indian uh, style. Uh, Indian style. I, or? Indian style. Yeah. Okay. Even you know, everywhere you just make this kind of Indian food. Yeah, I must invite you sometime. Hi, I'm <laughs> hoping for an invite. Your yeah. daughter-in-law makes the best desserts in Delhi, so it'll be nice to your main courses also. <laughs> Thank you. Thank all you. All the dessert queen. Thank you. Tell me. Uh, as an editor, how do you visualize the uh, future growth of India? Is India headed to be a world power? I think if we were headed to be a world power, then we've had a roadblock somewhere along the way. It was possible even 10 years ago to say that the hyphenation between India and Pakistan would end. It would become India-China. I don't think we can say that any longer. I think we have, the world is still back to talking about India, Pakistan, and partly we've done it to ourselves with our own obsession with Pakistan. Certainly the sort of growth that we had envisaged, the kind of comparisons with China have not happened. Some of it in the last couple of years has been inevitable and unavoidable because of COVID, but it's still, I think, many, many mistakes on our part as a nation. So if we play our cards right, yes, we could be a world power. Are we playing our cards right? No, we are not. No, we are not. We are not. We are not. And, uh, I mean, look at this uh, uh, law on uh, taxation. Isn't that crazy? The fact that it took so long and they're only now talking about reversing it, it's absurd. Yeah. You, they could, uh, the Income Tax Act says you should keep six years files. Yeah. And this law says you can go into anything. Yeah. And it's, it's just the repressive power of the Indian state. No, you can inconvenience individuals. You can inconvenience businesses. Yeah. If the law doesn't allow you to do it, then change the law. Do it retrospectively. Yeah. It's yeah. frightening. Well, uh, I hope your book does very well. And uh, it's, uh, I have really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. 400 and odd pages is a lot of thick book. It's a big book, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, um, now you want to have uh, questions from the audience? Did, did I hear that? Yes, I'll... Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Prem Prakash. And uh, uh, good evening to Mr. Veer Sangvi. I think correctly, we can call your book and you the rollicking tell-all from someone who has known all. So we have a few questions and um, uh, some of them may be uh, common and you may, be, may have answered them. So the first one is uh, anonymous. Nobody has written the name. It says that looks like the media, movie, politics and mafia are so closely interconnected. How does a common simple man get to know the true picture? It's like we've read news passed through filters. Where is the true news? I think that's over-dramatizing it and I don't think there are very many 
common people who are members of FIKI or of FLO. So let's leave that aside for the time being. But speaking generally, no, I don't think there are mafias. And I don't think India is run by one mafia which comprises all of these people. Yes, there are connections between crime and politics. There are connections between crime and films. Unfortunately, the way the Indian system works, the worst kind of crimes get on are the ones that happen outside of criminal areas, white collar crimes, as Primji pointed out. So yes, there is much to be concerned about, but this notion that a criminal underworld runs everything and that the poor members of FIKI are excluded from any real power, I think may be an exaggeration. Yeah, I think that sounds um, uh, quite a correct picture. The next uh, question we have is from Gauri Desh Pandey. They say media is the fourth pillar of democracy. Do you think it is still a valid statement? Yeah, I'm going to actually ask Premji to answer that because he has seen the growth of the Indian media much more than I have. He was there at the beginning. He was introduced to Panditji in 1952 and has been part of it. Premji, do you think the Indian media is still the fourth pillar of democracy? No, it's not. I thought he would say I'm, that. I'm, 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 I'm as categorical as that. You see, um, uh, Veer, yeah. look at the uh, television channels. It's a uh, where is the news? Opinion, opinion, opinion. Is that what we, where do people get news? Only on Doodoshin. Yeah. So uh, yeah. the channels have somehow, I'm afraid, moved on to uh, politics. It's a, it's a very strange situation. Yeah, I think we've become a society that prizes opinion over fact that yes. prizes bias over objectivity, a society that prizes sensation over reasonableness, and mm. that's not good for the media. I mean, look at Pandaji's days. Yeah. Pandaji, when somebody asked him to uh, somehow, uh, the, the, when there's, there's so much criticism about his uh, government, somebody said, we should, you should control the press. He said, no. I'm very comfortable with an irresponsible independent press than with a controlled press. Those were the days, huh? Those were the days, yes. Those were the days. I remember uh, once I wrote a very nasty letter because uh, I was not allowed to cover the launch of some ship in Bombay. And I wrote a very bad letter. I was very young and I could use that terrible language. Uh, ML Bhardwaj, the then principal information officer, invited me into his office, gave me a cup of tea and said, Prem, Punjabi, he was a Punjabi. Ehoji language ne istamal kari di. You shouldn't use such language. <laughs> so it was a different word. Yes, any other question? Yes, I think that was really insightful coming from two stalwarts from this uh, media and no having known so many people in politics as well. Next, we have um, from Gurleen Kaur, who says uh, she would like to know your view upon revoking of Article 370 from JNK in the recent past. I think this is another one for Prem Premji because he was there when all this initially happened. What do you think? You would you you think they handle the 370 thing properly? Prem? You see, uh, first of all, let's see. Uh, the state acceded to India. And uh, the idea of uh, having a plebiscite was Pandiji's. And then this idea of 370, which is itself says temporary. Now, how temporary it was, I don't know. So therefore, one should have known that it's going to be removed one day. And people in the Ladakh, where I traveled, I traveled in, uh, in Kashmir quite a lot, covered these stories a lot. In uh, nine, up to 1982, I can tell you, Kashmiris were more Indian than many Indians. The problem began only after that, when uh, Abdullah government was dismissed by Mrs. Gandhi, which was very unfortunate. That's where when this uh, Salauddin went away to uh, Pakistan to say, saying that uh, these people don't uh, respect democracy or they don't want to give us our rights in, the, in a state like they give to other states. So why should we tolerate them? So uh, now, uh, same way with Jammu people were unhappy. 
with what was going on from Kashmir. I don't know really uh, whether it will have a good result. It by people in uh, Ladakh, we are told, are very happy. People in Jammu are happy. Uh, Kashmir also, you know, the trouble is basically what is known as the emerald footprint. It's the area within the valley where these uh, troublemakers are. Other areas like Kargil and so on are fairly peaceful. So uh, let's wait and see. But I'll, just, I'll, just add, add, just, sorry, I'll just add to that. He's very correct when he talks about the dismissal of the Abdullah government by Mrs. Gandhi and Arun Nehru. It gave, and then the rigging of an election afterwards. It gave, right. it, yeah, it gave Kashmiris the impression that India was not serious about democracy. And it created a huge amount of alienation. There was one other factor, which is that after 1971, when Bangladesh became independent, 71, 72, Pakistan was not a very attractive option for anybody to look at. Oh. All of that changes around 1989, when the Afghan Jihad ends. Oh. And the Pakistanis who had done this Afghan Jihad with American money were left with all these fighters, all these weapons, didn't know what to do with them. They sent them to Kashmir. And that's the beginning of our insurgency. Veer, yeah. did you ever go into Afghanistan? What do you think of that? I haven't been there, sir. Never see, been to Afghanistan. Never been to Pakistan, let alone Afghanistan. Well, well see, I, I used, I've been to Afghanistan during very happy days. It was such a nice country. I, I'm told that. It was such a nice country. The, the, there was such a change taking place. Yeah. There were women in Western clothes and so on. High, good education, everything was fine. The people were happy. And then, uh, well, it's very, very unfortunate. I mean, that, that's a long story that one would have to say, but I don't want to hold up other questions. Okay. All right. So there are a whole lot of other questions, but I think we don't have time for all of them. I'll just make the next question a little short. In your opinion, who's been the best PM? And do you feel caste uh, plays an unhealthy role in today's political environment? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a quick answer. I think anybody giving an honest answer about who's been the best Prime Minister of India has to say Jawaharlal Nehru, because if he hadn't been Prime Minister of India, I don't think there would be India today. He steered us through the most difficult phases of our life, of our life as a country. He made wrong decisions in many cases. Nobody grudges him that. In that situation, it was not always easy to make the right decisions. Does caste play an unhealthy role? Yes, it does. But you must remember that when India became independent, India was full of communal tensions, full of caste tensions. India's politicians worked very hard initially to try and make sure that caste doesn't matter. If you look at the great mandates of the 1970s, you look at Indira Gandhi's mandate, it had no caste factor. You look at the Jan Jan Janta Party mandate in 77, there was no caste factor. Rajiv Gandhi, 84, 85, no caste factor. Caste has been brought back into Indian politics by India's politicians, starting with VP Singh. And I don't think history will forget them. So this last question was from Archana Dalmia. And this brings us to the end of a very, very interesting session. And on behalf of Prabha Khetan Foundation, I, Nalini Mehra from Spectrum Pune, would like to thank Mr. Veer Sangvi and Mr. Prem Prakash for such an engaging session. I would also like to thank our presenter, Sri Cement Limited. Last but not the least, or rather I'd say I'm saving the best for the last. I would like to thank all our patrons who have made these sessions possible during difficult times. Stay well, stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. It's bye from us till next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, Veer. Bye, everybody. Such an honor, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.